our message is about a Christian uh, virtue, which we call as contentment. Contentment, a needed virtue. Now, as I tell you this, as I go on with this message, let me tell you I'm preaching to myself. I, so I chose the topic because I, th I thought I needed to preach to myself. So when you hear yourself a lot more, you tend to make a lot more changes, right? So just like you're hearing it, I'm hearing this message for myself today. So we live in this world with rampant discontentment. So virtually everywhere, people are telling you that you should have enough or you are entitled for more. You know, this is not enough. You look at certain taglines, our advertisements. When I was a young girl, we, when we got our first TV, it was uh, an Onida. And you know what the tagline of Onida says? Neighbors envy, owners pride. So it's telling you, you know, you have something where someone else would like it. But then after a point of time, Onida lost its glory, right? Or take a packet of lace chips. What will you say? You can't eat just one. It's not enough. You need more. So we are in this, uh, in, a, in this life where there's so much of consumerism that's going on. I want, I want, I want, but still, after I want, it's not, it's not enough. So we are always looking for bigger, better, more, but land up in, in feeling very insufficient or inadequate with what we have. Sometimes we also interpret our situations that way. We sometimes think our difficult situations are not God's will. So we move from job to job, um, we move from house to house, relationship to relationship, marriage to marriage, uh, some cause to some cause, and then you just accumulate things, finally thinking that we are entitled to something that is better, but still feel very, very discontent. So have I got you? Is this what we all feel? Yes, I have company? Okay, all right. So we're going to be looking at um, as how, as people of God, we can live in contentment as God desires. Okay, so I'm, I've broken the sermon into four sections. So we're going to initially look at defining contentment. What is contentment? We will look at why should we pursue contentment? Then we look at let's understand cont contentment the way the Bible talks about it. And lastly, how to be content. Okay, so shall we start with the word go? Yes. Okay, so I'm a student of science and uh, I love definitions because it gives me a perspective of what I am thinking about. So that's why you will find defining. So a lot of people when they talk to me, they say you are a science student because I will be talking about things that sound very science. So this helps me find a picture, and I'm hoping that it helps you find one too. So let's look at the definition. So it says, it's a def a contentment is an innermost assurance in the sovereignty and goodness of God that produces joy, peace, and thanksgiving regardless of outside circumstances. Okay? So we're going to be breaking up this entire definition for us to be able to understand. So let's look at the first one. Contentment is innermost. What is inner, innermost? It's something that is internal. It's something that is deep inside of you. So contentment springs from within you and not from outside of you. So we often think that contentment is dependent on what we have or what we possess. But contentment is defined as an inner, inner springing up of something that is, um, uh, uh, of something that is good or something that, that makes you feel happy, something that makes you feel settled, okay? So it's something that springs up within and it's something that's sourced inward to the outside. So it's only that if you feel contentment in your belly, are you gonna be able to show it? out, okay? And it is only a new heart that can, um, that can source this contentment. Let's look at an example. So we all know the example of Paul and Silas. Now, Paul and Silas was in prison. What do you think they did in prison? They were singing songs. Isn't it, isn't it crazy? 
crazy? But that is contentment. I mean, I meant isn't it crazy as in a good way. Right? To be in a place of bondage, but yet experience the freedom that comes out of contentment. So they were singing songs not because of the jail conditions that were there, or not because that they had to be there, but it was because of what they, the source of their contentment. Right? Do you agree? So contentment is innermost. Let's look at the next one. It says it is an assurance. So what is an assurance? This assurance is not a pretense. It's not, ke sara, sara, whatever will be, will be. It's not that. It is that, that surety. It's not showing up that claim that things are okay. It is the assurance that things are well, things are happy, things are okay, right? Next, it says, sovereignty and goodness of God. Where is contentment rooted in? Contentment is rooted in who God is. It's not rooted in my abilities or my skill or my charismatic personality or my possession. It's not rooted in that. It's rooted in the persona of God, the character of God. So when we're looking at... Um, uh, uh, th there is a principle that, that I think we need to understand. That whatever we hope in is what we will be trusting in. Whatever we hope in is what we will be trusting in. Let me give you some examples. So if you hope in your ability as an athlete, you think that's what's helping you get into the academy of sport. Or you think you're, you, have, you have a brilliant intellect you think that's what's getting you into, the, into a college. Or you think you, you have good looks, and you think that's what's going to get you a spouse. I didn't have reactions. East, I had people saying, yeah. Right? Or you, you think that it's our pos uh, the possessions that we have, the money that we have that helps us assume, uh, uh, um, have land, or, or, or things that we call as well wealth. But what we don't understand is these are false gods. We trust in false gods. We were all created, so uh, think of it like this, we were all created with a vacuum, with a, with a big deep hole inside of it, which we, we actually run after these false gods for it to be filled. But the truth is it can only be in the truth and the knowledge of Jesus. Because otherwise, all these false gods are temporary. They will give you joy, sure, for some time, but it's like those shoes. After a point of time, you don't want to wear them. You want something better. So it is rooted in who God is. And lastly, contentment is fitting our hearts to our circumstances. It's fitting our desires to our possessions or our circumstances. Let me give you an example. Suppose you, for those of you who drive, and you took a car uphill, on the fourth gear, what do you think would happen? Your car would steam up, right? And it's not, it's going to protest. But then, if you move it down to a second gear or to a first gear, you're gonna have a smooth ride up to your destination, and it may, it may be faster than the other one, isn't it? So similarly, contentment is like that. It's fitting your uh, desires to your circumstances. Like, for example, my children sometimes look through our bank balance. You know why? Because they want to know if we, are, if we can afford an international trip. So we slowly put them on first gear, and we say, the trip that we're going to is our usual places of Uti or Kunur or Kerala, because that's what fits our circumstance. And that's where we find contentment in, right? So contentment is moving your desires to fit your circumstance. So are we good? Yes? First, first one-fourth over. Now just to manage the next three-fourth. If someone else is sleeping, say you'll be content after the message. 
We'll move on to the next section of, of understanding why is it necessary that we have to go after contentment? Why should I pursue contentment? So the first point on this line is we are exhibits of hope. We are exhibits of hope. So if you've been to zoos, you know, the poor animals are like exhibits and we all go wide-mouthed to watch it, right? We are like that. In the world around, you and I are zoo exhibits. Why? Because people are watching our hope. People are watching what happens to us when we go through a struggle. How is it that we cope? How is it that, what is it that we place our hope in? So, so we need to pursue contentment because our hope matters to the world that is watching. Our hope matters to the world that is watching. Now, if you look at the verse that is there up on the screen, it's 1 Peter 3.15. It says, always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. Always be ready to give a defense. And this is a hard question sometimes for me to face. I don't have many people coming and asking me or telling me, you know, you're such a hopeful person. You know, where does your joy and your hope come from? And I think that's a shame. And I think that's what we've got to ask ourselves. Am I a beacon of God's hope to the world that does not know him, to the world that does not see him? Am I showing my hope in spite of the fact that we are all in a broken existence, uh, existence? Am I being a spectacle of God's glory? Am I being that person who is, uh, uh, who is broken but not crushed, who is burnt but not consumed? Am I that? Well, that's the question that we need to ask ourselves because as a Christian, as all of us sitting here together, we are living examples of hope in Christ. We walk a daily walk where we're showing people that our hope is in Christ and nothing else. Because if we are not satisfied with what God provides, why would someone who doesn't know the Lord want to look at your hypocr hypocritical life, look at your lack of faith? Why would they want to? They wouldn't want to. So we need to pursue contentment because we are exhibits of hope to the outside world. We need to pursue contentment also because we are encouragers in, in the faith. Now, what does that mean? The hope that we have encourages other believers. Uh, we were at East this morning, and I was talking to one of the members there, and her father has been going through a series of illness and has been in the hospital. And she was telling me how uh, just when they went to visit him, her mother-in-law fell ill as well. But she was, she was talking about how good the grace of God is because the father got better through, the, through that time. So when we show contentment, even at difficult times, we are encouraging our brothers and our sisters. We are saying, hey, you know, this is what happened. This is how it went. And you encouraged, you are moved to say, yes, I must hold on to that faith that... That, that God puts into my heart. So we need to be encouragers of God's faith towards a believer, towards a brother and a sister. So let's make sure that we live lives of peace and gratitude so it encourages your neighbor. So it encourages your neighbor. And the last thing is we need to be overflowers of joy. Overflowers of joy. You know, um, uh, it is God's desire. Do you think it's God's desire that you be contented and happy and grateful? Yes, it is. When Jesus, before he went to the cross, you know what he did? Did he curl up in his couch and feel bad? What did he do? Instead, he gathered his friends and said, come. I don't want you to be disheartened. I want you to be encouraged. And what did he tell them? You know, it's beautiful. The scripture between John 14 to 17 is beautiful with what God leaves with his disciples. He says, 
He says, I am the truth, I am the way, I am the life. He's giving them perspective. He's saying, uh, when I go, I'm going to send you somebody. I'm going to send you the promise of the Holy Spirit who's going to be with you. He says, I'm, I'm the vine and you will live, abide in me. So that, read John 15, 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. So we overflow with joy because of who God is. We overflow with, with that knowledge of, of his reality. And that is why we can be content. That's why we should be pursuing contentment. Okay, so are we good? All right, so we're going to be living out of contentment so that God has the praise and glory and thereby it increases our joy. We all know that praise brings in joy. A song brings in a joy. Praise always brings in a smile. So that's what we would want to pursue. Okay, now we're going to get into the next section, which is understanding contentment. Now this was a shocker to me, okay? I didn't expect to read what I read, but I hope this is going to shock you out of your seats as well. Because if it doesn't, then I may need to preach it once more. Okay? So, we're going to look at what the Bible says contentment is. So, the first thing that the Bible says contentment is, is that it is a... Can I hear it? So, it is a command that God wants me content. Can, I, can we all say that? It is a command that God wants me content. You don't want to be content? You do, right? So if you look at this verse, it starts with the word, let. Where is that word familiar? Let. In Genesis 1. So what does God say? Let there be light. Let there be, let there be, let there be. So what is he doing? He's issuing a command. He's issuing a decree. He's saying, let there be. Church, that's very similar. Let there be contentment. Let your conduct be without covetousness. So it is a command that we are asked to obey. So what does that mean? It would mean that we live a disposition or a character without coveting, without looking at my neighbor and saying, I wish I had his car, or I wish I had his shoes, or I wish I had his whatever, whatever possessions he, ha he has. It says, you know, be free from that. He says, it's be, be free from the conduct that drives you to greed, or to avarice, or to lust. He says, be free from that. So in other words, he's saying, if you grumble, what are you doing? You're challenging the goodness of God. You're saying, God, uh, you know, did you get this right? Did you need my help? Do you want me to set this part of my life a bit okay? I can give you directions. I know how it goes. We are questioning the goodness of God when we show discontentment. And this was very well seen in, in the tribe of Israel, right? When God moved them out from Egypt into Canaan, what did they do? I remember we had a Sunday school song on grumble, 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 grumble. Right? That's what they did. They just grumbled. And it was the sin of grumbling that they were in, they were into. In spite of the fact God commands them to remember. He says, remember the day I bought you out from Egypt. Remember the, my mighty hand, my outstretched arm that bought you out. He says, remember, but still Israel goes into the sin of grumbling. So what do we leave with us today? Is that contentment is a command. So tomorrow morning when you get up saying it's Monday morning, I've got to go to school, got to go to work. Remember, contentment is a command. Amen? Very quiet. Okay. So we'll get on to the next shocker. Contentment is the matter of the heart. Let me take you through scripture. This is something that shook me. 
Jude 15 and 16. So it says, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment. Okay, that's underlined. No, it's not. Okay. To execute judgment on all, to convict all who are, all who are ungodly. Among them, all of their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and all of the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him, these are, can, I, can you say it like you mean it? Grumblers and complainers. So what are we in for, church? What am I in for? Complaining and discontentment in, as the scripture says, is a sin that calls for judgment. Now that's huge, right? We do, we complain at every, everything, right? But it's, it, it says it's a call for judgment. Why is it a call for judgment? Because it reveals the inside of you. It reveals the inward condition of your heart. Because coveting happens in secret. Now, for example, let's suppose I, I covet my neighbor's bike, right? If I were to steal it, it's a very open thing. But when I covet, they don't even know that I'm coveting. They don't even know that I'm coveting. It's all happening inside of you. And that's what God, God is very concerned about. Holiness for God does not happen just in our behavior. It happens in the uprightness of our heart. Holiness is no, just not in our behavior, just not, not stealing it. Holiness depends on what's happening in my heart. Am I seeking something from somebody's life or from somebody's possession? That's what God is, is concerned about. That's what he desires would change. So discontentment often has something to say about the sin that we harbor more than our circumstances. So it's not about our circumstances. It's the sin that we are holding inside of us. You know, the Israelites complained to Moses. What does God say? They are not complaining to you, Moses. They're complaining about me. You see, God recognizes that. And I'm sure that's exactly what God feels when we complain. That we're not complaining about what has happened, we're complaining about what is, about God and his goodness. So we need to be honest that our dissatisfaction is discontent with God. Our dissatisfaction or discontentment is not discontentment of our circumstances, but it is discontentment with God. So let's be honest to know that because a complaining spirit indicates there's a problem in our hearts and thereby there's going to be a problem in our relationship with God. So let's remember that contentment is, is something that we need to root out right straight from the heart. We go on, we move on. The third one is contentment is refusing to resent. Contentment is refusing to resent. So in every situation that happens, we all have this habit of interpreting our situations. Yes? So let's say you're in school or you're at your workplace and your manager or your teacher um, asks your best friend or your, you know, your colleague to do a project that you are better at that you know that you're better at. How do we interpret such a situation? Are we all awake? Yes? So how do we interpret the situation? Oh, this guy wants to sideline me. I know that he wants to make me quit. That is why he's doing this. I know he hates me. I know that he wants uh, this guy to get above me. He wants to put him up as my manager. This is all, this is it, this is it. Yeah? See, the young people are agreeing, thank you, I love you. Or, okay, so then let me give an example for the older ones then. 
So let's say... <laughs> it's if, you, if you give an example, it kind of reflects what's happening at your home. So. <laughs> okay, so let's say um, the husband comes home late. Familiar? Yes, okay. So the husband comes home late and um, he doesn't say a word. He just comes in and he has his dinner and he goes to sleep. So what do we all beautiful ladies do? He doesn't love me anymore. I'm no more the love of his life. I once was. He doesn't, con he doesn't care if I've eaten or not. Yeah, we go into that sob story. So we interpret a situation. Whatever it may be, we interpret a situation. And when that happens, what do we do? We begin to enjoy that prison of resentment. We say, let me walk in it, uh, you know, get comfortable in this, and then starts bitterness and anger. So if we lock ourselves in the prison of resentment, we can be sure that we will stay in the interpretation of our minds. When you lock yourself in that resentment, you will stay in the interpreta interpretation of your mind. So what do we do? We can choose. God has made us volitional beings of who can, of, we can choose. We can say, I will choose to resent or I will choose to walk in freedom. Amen? I will choose to resent or I will choose to walk in freedom. Now, this just does not happen here. You know, in counseling sessions, we have so many people who come to us and talk about their past or their childhood. And they say, you know, if I had better parents, I wouldn't be like this. Or if I had a better home, I wouldn't be like this. If I had um, enough finance, I would have been somewhere, elsewhere. We choose what we want to think. So I can go around saying, I didn't get the best that I, had, that, that I should have had. I'm not in the best place that I should have been. I can keep going on doing that. Or I can say, I live in the freedom of being away from all of this. Amen? So living in contentment is a choice. You either choose to bicker about it, or you choose to speak life, or you choose to see it differently. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. When you look at it in your own situations, you know the times that you have easily gone to that pattern of resentment. So contentment is choosing not to resent. And I, and I believe that solves half of, your, half of your problem. Does it? Church? Yes. Amen. Okay. Now... When one of the biggest examples about, about uh, someone not showing resentment is Joseph. You know, Joseph, we read uh, the book of Genesis as if it happened one day after a time. So we said, okay, one day thrown into the well, the next day thrown into prison, few more days, and then out became a prime minister. No, these were long years. And after those many years, what does Joseph say? He says... Look at the verse. He says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. He, he chose to see it as a blessing. He chose to see, you know, I am free. I don't have to stay in this prison, prison of resentment so that I am dead, but I am free to know that God used me to help you. Isn't that beautiful? And that's what God seeks of us. Because resentment is... It's repetitive. And the more we do it, the more it tastes better. But we need to keep that aside. We need to throw that out of our plate and ensure that we, we choose to be content. Next one is contentment is not innate, but it is learned. So we are all not born with contentment. It did not come in your baby package. It did not. What came in your baby package was whining. If you have a baby, if he wants milk, what will he do? 
wine. So we all, it's, it's nature to us to wine. So it is not innate, it is learned. And that's what Paul recognized. So he says, he says, I have learned the secret of being content in any situation. I have learned the secret of being content in any situation, which means he's saying it's a discipline. Being content is a discipline. You have to work through it, okay? It's something that you have to put your mind in. You have to ensure that, the, that it, it, it is a process. It's a grace that is given to you that, um, th that you learn the contentment. So what the implication here is, Paul is saying, hey, I did not become content in day one. It took me a process. It took me a long time. It took me many situations to gradually get to the place that I am. So let's start when? Now. Let's start now because it's a process. Because God wants us to reach a place of overflowing joy. Overflowing joy. We all live in depression. We all do. But he says, uh uh, that's not yours. Abundance of joy is yours. And that's the process. So let's get on with the process of pursuing contentment as the way the Lord has, has said. Amen? Okay, tell your neighbor we are halfway, there's only half more to go. Okay, good. Right, so now is the good part. How do I become content? How, what is my learning? So like I told you, contentment is not a propensity of man. It's, if you have a garden, it's not hard to grow weeds, is it? It will just come in. But if you want to cultivate a, I don't know, a banana tree or a whatever, whatever you want to, it takes work, it takes effort, you have to cultivate it. It doesn't come naturally, but weeds come naturally, and that's how it is for us. We complain so easily, and that's why it is a learning process. That's why it's something uh, that, that we cultivate to do, and even after we cultivate it, even after you put in your flowers, flowering plants, you have to be watchful. Otherwise, you know, the complaints will come in. Little by little by little, it'll come, and you have to be watchful. So we're going to take our understanding of, of how to be content through the scripture uh, that Paul wrote. It's Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. Let me read this out for you. And if you look at it, if you look at it, it is like a personal testimony. You know, he's saying, I have done this, I have done that, I, I, I. So he's actually giving you his personal testimony. All right? So let's read that. It says... Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I have learned both to be full and be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So he makes four personal I statements there. Okay, it's all highlighted for you. He makes four personal I statements. So let's look. Uh, I also want to bring to your notice, you know where Philip wrote, uh, sorry, uh, Paul wrote this, this letter? He was in prison. Isn't it strange that someone in prison can write about contentment? You are in bondage, you are in slavery, but through it, he's saying, I am content. I think that's a, an amazing testimony. That's an amazing testimony that we need to look at. How can we emulate what Paul has done? So he says this first sentence. He says, we, we dealt with the first one, I have learned. The second one he says is, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. So what Paul is saying is, I have been in extreme circumstances. I have been in a place of being abased, which means, the meaning of that word is to be humiliated. How many of us have been humiliated? Thank you, my young people. How many of us have been depressed? That's another word, that's another, how many, yes, I, I yeah. 
So we have been humil he has been humiliated, he has been depressed. So don't think Paul has not gone through what you and I have gone through. So he has known the depth of darkness and he has also known the place of abundance. To be full, to, be, to have excess, to be superfluous. So there may be a lot of us who've had a season of excellence, so we've had a season of abundance. So what Paul says is, I know what it has been to be in two extremes. I know, I'm, I'm sure he's also saying, I know what it is to be in between. I know, I know it, okay? So this is for us, Paul knows it. So what he's saying definitely does make some sense because we've either been in either of those extremes or we've, been, we've also been in between. What does he talk about next? He talks about next is how he learned to be content. So let's look at that. How do we learn to be content? The first way is to savor every blessing. Savor every blessing. So the best example I can think about is sometimes when we order out, when we order in, you know, we will order something hoping that there is lots, but when it comes, there's like three and a half pieces. You know what I'm talking about, right? So, you know what Jer my son does? He will keep that till the end. He will keep that till the end to savor the best for the last. That's what scripture is saying. Savor every blessing. So what does scripture say? Philippians 4 verse 8. It says, whatever things are true, noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report, if there's any virtue and, uh, and is, there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. He said, if there is anything that is good, meditate on it. So you will say, you'll say, you know, I have a terrible job. I'd say, what is the blessing there? You have a job, right? Or you say, I have uh, a quarrelsome family. How do you savor it? I have a family. Or you say, you know, I have this illness that I'm coping with, but I'm not dead. No, I'm just joking. Right, but you savor every blessing that God puts into your, your life. So, so you, you know, you, uh, you move it to any situation, there is a blessing in everything. There is a blessing in, ev in, in almost everything that, that we can see. So what is he saying over here? It says, bring to mind, which is a very conscious decision. Bring to mind, think about these things. It's something that you and I have got to do. And this is very consistent in scripture. If you look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, set your mind on things above. So it's something that we do very, very consciously to be able to think of, of good things. Because where you choose to focus on makes a radical difference of the experience of your heart. Where you choose to focus on makes a radical difference about the experience of your heart. So the more that you think of that good thing in all of that which is not content, you move into a greater, uh, greater place of contentment. Amen? All right. So how do we cultivate this habit? There are three ways that we cultivate this habit. It is in our thinking. It's also in our speaking. Now when you talk about your job to somebody else, if you're going to bash your job up, you're not savoring the blessing. Yes? So it's in your thinking, it's in your speaking, it's even in your praying. So what does Philippians, um, what does Philippians 4.8 say? It says, sorry, not 4.8, 7, Philippians 3.7, it says, um, sorry, I'm lost. It says, be anxious for nothing, but... With prayer and pre petition, present your request to God with what? With bickering? With thanksgiving. So you cultivate the habit of savoring the blessing in your thinking, in your speaking, as well as in your praying. 
And also, when we begin to savor a blessing, the Holy Spirit starts to work. You know what he does? He will begin to lessen the suffering and increase the mercy or increase the grace. As you look at the good things, he will begin to lessen the suffering and increase the grace. And that's exactly opposite of what the devil does. What does he do? He will minimize the blessing and accentuate the suffering. So if you were to have a blessing, you'll say, okay, great, you know, I got this promotion. So immediately, Satan will say, oh, promotion, thousand bucks. Right? That's what, that's what happens when we begin to, uh, that, what the Holy Spirit starts doing. So it's like this, when, you, when you're listening to music, you can either choose to put the bass or the treble on. So if you put the bass on, you hear it thumping. If you put the treble on, you hear it a different way. So you can choose how you want to savor it, whether you want to, whether you want to savor it or whether you want to look at, at, at the other part of it. So savor the blessing and, and make sure that you turn your, your blessing up and tune down your want. Turn the mercies up and tune down the want. Now, even as I'm saying this, this does not mean that as a Christian, you have to go pretending. There are real sufferings and anxieties and griefs that we've faced or that we may be facing. Contentment does not mean that you pretend or say that it doesn't exist because that's the first question that comes up. But what does content, what, what does it mean? It means that you need to put alongside, you need to put alongside your, your suffering with your blessing. You put it alongside, you bring it together. So let me give you certain examples of how to do that. So suppose you face persecution for your faith, right? You say, okay, I, I know I'm being persecuted for my faith, but I have a church or a life group that builds me up, right? Or I have, um, uh, I have a hard-pressed job, but then I do get a good salary. So whatever it is that's causing your suffering, it may be extremely intense. And remember, God is a God of realities, and he does know what you're going through. He does know that you are in, in difficult positions, but he wants us, even in that state, to put it alongside a blessing so that we are not sucked in. We are not sucked in like we're sucked in into quicksand, because the more we complain, we are in quicksand. We're, we're there, we're down. So let's look at, at the way that we respond to even our biggest griefs. So what's the first point? How do we learn to be content? It's a test. Savor the blessing. The second one is to affirm the sufficiency of Christ. Affirm the sufficiency of Christ. When you look at verse 12 in that same passage, he talks about, I know how to abound. I know how it is to be in need. I know how it is to be hungry. I know how it is to lack. But the very next thing that he suggests is, I also know the secret of being content. So Paul is giving you a secret here. He's saying here is a secret. And you know what the secret is? It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So what's Paul doing? He's connecting the secret of contentment with the strength of Jesus Christ. That's what he's, he's connecting that. He said, hey guys, this is a secret. Contentment, the only way is through the strength of Jesus Christ. Now, contentment does not also mean that you are indifferent to your circumstances. Like you, you know, you say, okay, there's nothing that I can do about it. Let me resign. I'm giving up. If it's like this, it's like that. It does not mean that. I want to take you to an, another example of Paul. You remember the time when Paul prays to God for the thorn in his flesh? What does Paul do? Does he say, it's there, I will live with it? 
No, he goes back to God on three different occasions and asks God. He said, God, take this out from me. I don't want this. I don't want to settle with this. I want something. I want this out of my life. I want, he says it, right? He was not indifferent to his circumstance, but this is the answer that God gives him. He says, if you see, it's very similar. It's in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Do you see the similarity in both this? That there's grace, that is strength, contentment in every situation is the grace and the strength of the Lord. So in any circumstance of your life, Christ gives you strength. No matter what your suffering is, he will give you an equal measure of his grace and strength to deal with it. Amen? So if you're going through something that is huge, you can be sure that God gives you that grace to deal with it. God gives you the power and the grace to face that situation. That is why we are asked not to worry. Therefore, do not worry about your today or your tomorrow because when the time comes, his grace will be there. How many of you have come to places and situations where, you know, when you look back at it, you say, I don't know how I went through that. Yes? Yes, do we have those times? Yes. We look back and say, I have no clue. But that's it. The grace of God will be given to you, will be meted out to you as and when you need it. You can be assured of that. And that is knowing that he will take care of every one of your situations, every one of your problems with, the, with, with only the grace that he can offer. Amen? So let's look at how we can uh, um, not look at our circumstances as indifferent, but let us know that we are not controlled by those circumstances. We're never controlled by our circumstances. So what are the first two points? How do we become content? Now this has to drive home, church. Save our blessing. Affirm the sufficiency of Christ. Okay, and the last one is to live in the fear of the Lord. To live in the fear of the Lord. Now true contentment is a God-centered life. I want to take you through that first scripture of 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now, you know when Paul writes this, he writes this to Timothy, and he tells them that the church in Ephesus are going through some wrong teachings. And the prevalent teaching that was happening there is that godliness is a, gain to make, is a way to make money. So the, he says that in uh, Timothy 6, 1 Timothy 6, 5, he says, this godliness is great gain. So he's saying, you know, you have a, a, a life full of God, fast buck. But Paul's telling Timothy, Timothy, my boy, be careful. That is wrong teaching. And he's aligning Timothy to the understanding that great gain comes only when there is godliness with contentment. So what does that mean? What is godliness? Godliness is a God-centered life. It is a life that has reverence to God. It is a life that you, where you live in the fear of God. Because when you live in the fear of God, you have contentment and that makes you a rich man. It makes you a rich person in your spirit. It makes you a contented man. You know, the happiest man is not the man with wealth, but the man who is settled in his heart. And that's exactly what Timothy is saying, uh, Paul is saying here. Contentment with godliness is great gain. So for us, there's a formula here. Contentment plus godliness equal. I told you I was a chemistry, I'm a science student. Contentment plus godliness is great gain. I'd like to reiterate that with what Paul said in Philippians 1.21. He says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, Paul is a great guy, right? Because if you want to feel the contentment Paul, Paul had, what do you need to do? 
You need to live as Paul lived. And what, how did he live? He lived for me to live is Christ. Now let me give you fill in the blanks. Add, for me to live is dash. Whatever you add into that fill in the blank, let's say it's relationship, it's money, it's power, it's position, it's um, family, whatever you fill in, your answer is going to be wrong because it's not going to match it. It's going to say, and to die is loss. Remember we spoke about false gods? Because whatever we live for, there is not going to be any gain. We're going to have a loss. But the only way that you can fill in that blank is for you to live is Christ and to die is gain. So do you think it is possible that there are many discontent Christians because they claim to have Jesus as their savior, but they don't have supremacy of him in, in their lives? You can claim, you say, yes, Jesus is my savior, but then I am living the way that I want to. There is going to be discontentment. So living a self-centered life is a sure path to discontentment. But living a life under the reign and the rule and the reverence and the fear of the Lord is a sure way to contentment. Amen? So we've learned to be content. So we've got our three modules and we start now. So in conclusion, you know, Paul really talks about how to abound or how to be in need. And we, we've all been in, the, in that place. But do you think that our experiences can ever match what Jesus went through? Let's read from Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. It says, He made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant, coming to the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Isaiah 53.3 says it this way. He says, he was acquainted with sorrows. He was a man of sorrows. He was a man of grief. He was a man stricken. So do you and I ever think that what you and I are going through can ever match what Jesus went through? No, church. Not at all. Because what he did, he did out of complete contentment. Because there was a greater joy. What is the joy? That you and I would be with him. And that was his joy. And that was the contentment that he had as he went on the cross. So let's remember that those of us who lose everything for Jesus gain everything for him. When we lose everything for Jesus, we gain everything for him. And that's how I can be content. Because for his glory, his glory should be the passion of my life and a place where I will find my greatest contentment. Amen? So could we all just stand up and respond to what we've heard and I'd request the worship team to please come up. We all have been in this place where we have moved, we have looked for contentment, for happiness in different, different places. A lot of us know what, where, where we are at this point of time. We've looked, we've searched, some of us have tasted and found that that contentment is, does not hold water. It's, it's, it's not, it doesn't work for us. So God calls us to set our course to go after contentment. And that we will gain it by going after Jesus. We will gain it and look for it by going after Jesus. 
You know, some of us may recognize that that, that emptiness that we feel, the, uh, the void that we feel, we sometimes chase after it by being perfect. We do things thinking that perfection will make me content. Or we do things thinking that the approval of somebody else will make me content. Or we think that hard work will make me content. Or some of us have come to that place of complacency saying, there's nothing that I can do. I don't want to do anything about it. I, there's, there's, there's not a place that I want to go forward. Let's come before God and tell him, say, God, I know you have spoken to me today that none of this that I pursue brings contentment. Let's talk. Let's just open our mouths, pour out our hearts to him as we do so. my redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hope my hope of us who have gone far away from home this is what daddy says daddy says come home come home to a place of abundance the father calls you home daddy says I have abundance for you abundance that will give you great joy daddy says Come, live with me, live in me, and out of me will flow your joy.
for those of us who have sensed that deep darkness, that deep need of, of someone to fulfill it. He's calling you home. He says, this is your destination. This is where you get your abundance. Those of us who've, who feel anxious, who feel jittery, who feel worried about our tomorrows, He calls us. He calls us. He extends our hand. He extends His hand to you and calls you out. Because He knows. Daddy always knows. Daddy always knows what is right. And he says, come, come drink from me. Father God, we come to you today asking for you to set our hearts and our course on contentment. And we know you have told us, you've taught us that it comes only from a life in you and we commit our lives to you today we commit ourselves we make a commitment to drink of you we make a commitment to fall back on your strength to turn away from those false gods of perfection turn away from those false gods of approval of being right of working hard of finding love of doing well of achieving we we turn away from all of that and we seek you because you are the truest contentment for us Jesus we invite you in we invite you in this morning God to refresh us to renew us thank you father thank you Jesus if there is anyone here who wants to come back home, come back home. You've left home and you've turned away to find better things outside of home. This is a call for you to come back. This is a call for you to come back. Maybe we've not made a commitment ever to Jesus. Maybe we've not given our lives over to Jesus. If there is anyone over here, I don't wish to embarrass you, but if you could put up your hands, I would like to pray with you and seek you back into daddy's home. If there's anyone who would like to make a commitment, I see one ha hand up there. I see another hand there. Let me just pray with you. Father God, there are your children who are coming home. You enjoy that your children come home. And Father, even as they make that commitment to you, bring them home, Father. I want to say a prayer, if you could say it out with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for what you did for me on the cross. I thank you because you took away my sin so that I would be redeemed. I accept you as my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To you, I give my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Praise Jesus. Let's just receive the benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of the Father, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Amen. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org 
also visit our website abcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.